Welcome to the webinar. Today's session is going to be a demonstration of InVivo 11 for Windows. I'll give a high-level overview of the capabilities of InVivo 11 Starter, Pro, and Plus, with a specific focus on working with textual data. So you've gone out and collected some text-based data. Perhaps you conducted interviews or focus groups and had them transcribed, or you have other text documents. How do you start to find and understand themes, key quotes, and trends across all of the data you've collected? InVivo provides structure to unstructured data. It's a tool that organizes qualitative data and supports rigorous systematic analysis. There are three editions of InVivo 11 for Windows, Starter, Pro, and Plus. All three editions can work with a variety of text data. InVivo 11 Starter for Windows offers powerful yet easy to use tools for organizing and discovering insight and text-based data. If you need to analyze information like transcripts or articles, bring everything into InVivo to quickly and easily identify trends, themes, and patterns. InVivo 11 Starter is best for new users and those working only with text such as documents and PDFs. InVivo Pro and Plus can work with additional data types and also support working as a team. Pro and Plus provide additional features for analyzing text and visualizing themes. These capabilities include automatically coding your interviews and focus groups by question and speaker and cross-tabulating demographic information with themes. In Vivo Pro and Plus can handle many data types. You can import unstructured textual data from more documents, PDFs, .txt files, Evernote, OneNote, web pages, and email from Outlook. Once you have your text in InVivo, there are several tools that help you quickly get a sense of trends. The word frequency query helps you quickly identify keywords in the text. This word cloud is live to the data in InVivo, so, so you can easily explore how these themes are being used. Word trees help you identify prominent help you identify prominent words and phrases. These are produced using a text search query, which is a sophisticated find of those words and phrases. This is a mind map, which is visualizing a node hierarchy in InVivo. You can think of nodes as buckets for qualitative data and nodes gather re related material to one place to look for emerging patterns and ideas. You can create and code to nodes manually, as well as use tools within InVivo, such as the text search query, to jumpstart your coding and organization of the data. Use heading formatting in Word to structure or to st with structured or semi-structured interviews to be able to easily gather all interviewees' response to question one to a node called question one, or each time an individual speaks to a case node for that individual. Today I'm going to introduce tools in InVivo that are useful when analyzing text. I'll illustrate how InVivo can quickly identify questions and speakers and transcribe text and prepare your data for analysis. Then I'll cover some tools within InVivo, specifically the word frequency and text search queries that can help you quickly get a sense of key concepts in your data. Nodes, which again are buckets for qualitative data, pull together information from multiple documents. This makes it easy to see how an idea or concept has manifested across your data. I'll show multiple ways to create and organize nodes, including from a mind map. I'll also give you some tips on how to create a powerful node structure that makes the most of the query functions in InVivo. Next, we'll move into InVivo. All InVivo projects follow the same basic process, the first step of which is to gather data. Then you create an InVivo project and import those materials. From there, you can analyze and explore your data using sophisticated coding and query functions as well as create a beautiful visualization that helps you learn more about your data and communicate your findings to others. So I'm going to move out of PowerPoint and into InVivo. We're going to start in a blank InVivo project. 
if at any point you'd like a clarification on which features are available in Starter Pro or Plus, please ask that question using the question feature in GoToWebinar. Today I'll be working with some sample data from our sample project, uh, which is called Environmental Change Down East. So this project is about um, change that occurred after a period of economic growth in coastal North Carolina. And for simplicity's sake today, I'm going to be working with transcribed text from interviews. So these are interviews that were gathered as part of this project. And for reference, a complete sample project is available with every download of NVivo. So I've imported my transcribed interviews. And let's take a look at one of these interviews. So when I open up this interview, uh, these are conversations that have been recorded and transcribed into Word documents. And the formatting that was present in Word is preserved in NVivo. In other words, the documents would look the same if you were to take them out of NVivo and open them in Word. These are semi-structured interviews, meaning that the interviewer followed a set of questions, but can ask follow-up or probing questions. So as you stroll, scroll down, you can see that there's question two, question three, and some back and forth between the uh, interviewer and the interviewee under each. So you can choose to format your interviews if you have semi-structured or structured interviews to uh, be, make use of the autocoding feature in NVivo. So the autocoding feature allows you to gather all responses, for instance, to question one, to a node called question one. Or again, every time Henry speaks to a node called Henry, and every time Barbara speaks to a node called Barbara. Autocoding by structure in NVivo works based on paragraphs or paragraph styles. So this interview has been formatted using paragraph styles. So this is where the formatting in the interview becomes important. And if you're going to be auto-coding based on heading styles, consistent use of those styles is critical. So the interview is organized by question. So these are in heading one. Happen to know that. If you were open it in Word and click in that text, you could see what heading was being used. And each speaker is in heading two. So I'm going to grab all of my interviews here and autocode them using source structure or style. So NVivo detects these different formattings. And I'm going to start by um, autocoding by heading one, which again is a question. So again, because I've used heading one consistently across all of my interviews, I can tell NVivo to create a node for that question. So we'll create a node for question one and question two and so on. Then it asks me where do I want to put these. I can put them in um, a new or existing fold, folder or node, pardon me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder under nodes called interview questions and hit finish. So in just a couple of seconds, NVivo has read through all of my data. I'm going to grab this vertical bar, scoot it over, and create a node for each one of my questions. So I can open up and see here is all of Barbara's responses to question one. Scroll down, here's Linda's discussion. I'm sorry, Charles's discussion with Linda. Dorothy's discussion, and Nancy, and so on. You'll notice I have two question six nodes, and that's because the heading wording is slightly different. That's no problem. I can actually merge those together. Cases are another type of node. You'll see them over here. If you have multiple pieces of data for a given participant, or if you're doing a longitudinal study, um, or if you are working with demographic data, which I'll come back to, cases can help you keep all data related to a given participant in one place. 
cases are also useful to gather multiple pieces of data from a single source. So, for instance, I can create cases from an entire interview, or I can use autocoding to create a case that just contains each time my interviewee speaks. This is how I would create cases for focus groups as well. So I will return to autocoding. This time I'm going to choose heading two instead because that's where my speakers are. That's how they're organized. And this time again, I'm gonna put them under um, existing folder and specifically because I'm creating cases for each speaker, I'm gonna put them in my cases folder. So when I navigate down to my cases again, I now have a node for each one of my speakers. And what this has effectively done is just isolate in a very clean way every time Barbara speaks without Henry's interviewer text, every time Charles speaks without his interviewer text. And then because Henry has done multiple interviews here, I can see that he's done five interviews or five sources. Here's very cleanly all of Henry's interviewer text. I can see that Nancy is also an interviewer. If I wanted to organize these with interviewer and interviewee, interviewer and interviewer and interviewee, I can create organizational notes. And I can grab, I know that Nancy is an interviewer and Henry is an interviewer. We'll assume that the rest of these are interviewees, and I can organize them under parent notes. Cases differ from thematic nodes in another important way. If you have demographic information about your participants or other categorical information about your units of study, you can add that information to case nodes through classifications and attributes. We cover this more extensively in our mixed methods webinar, which is offered at the end of September, so next week, and the recording is also available on our YouTube channel. Now that I have my data organized and in vivo, I want to get a sense of some potential trends at a very high level. A word frequency query helps me to identify possible themes in my data by analyzing frequently used words and phrases. So I've run a word frequency query on all of my interviews and InVivo has just calculated the most frequently used words across all of my data. InVivo has a built-in stop words list, so it's ignoring filler words like it and is and that. If I see any words on the list that I'd like to exclude from future queries, I can easily add those to the stop words list. So east is in the name of the location. So that's not really helpful for me that people say east a lot. That's to be expected. So when I rerun that query, the word east is gone. Another useful tool in the word frequency query is the ability to automatically group words together. So right now, or previously, these results, um, it's counting exact words. So if I grouping slider bar on the right hand side there, so it's counting the word talk as a different word than talking. If I were to scoot that slider bar down a notch to stemmed words, it will group together words with the same stem or the same root, uh, giving me different a different view of the data. So I can ca tell people to cast that net even wider and group together synonyms, specializations, or generalizations. I typically like to leave it at uh, stemmed words. So you can see that different words have been pulled to the top, like fishing and water. So this gives me perhaps uh, definitely a different, perhaps a more accurate view of what people are discussing. And people will also create a word cloud of most frequently used words in my data, which can be a helpful visualization which words are bigger than others. So which words, so the larger the word, the more frequently that appears. I can choose to change how my word cloud looks. I have a couple of options. I can actually collapse this so you can see the word cloud more clearly. And I can also export my word cloud as a static image. 
Within InVivo, I can explore the use of a word by running a text search query, which I can run from within a word frequency query or on its own. But let's say I'm particularly interested in exploring the use of the word water. So I can right click here on water and run a text search query for it. Because I had told my word frequency query to look at stemmed words, and Vivo searched for both of those stems simultaneously. So here it's showing me all of the interviews in which either the word water or waters appears. Here in the reference view, uh, you can see water with a little bit of context. And it will also generate a word tree, which groups together words that appear frequently before and after the word water. So I can scroll up and down and see what are some of these branches. And over here to the right, I can see that the word quality frequently comes after the word water. So that tells me that people are discussing water quality as well as water more generally. So if I want to see what they're saying, I can run a text search query for specifically water quality. So I did that from the word tree, but I could also do that from scratch by typing in this box and putting quotes around water quality. And here I have water quality with a little bit of context, a list of all the interviews in which the phrase water quality appears, and a brand new word tree. Okay, let's say I want to pull together all discussion of water quality to one place and further investigate what people are saying about water quality. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it getting better or worse? So to do that, I would use a node. Again, a node is a bucket into which you put qualitative data and can help you gather related material to one place to look for emerging patterns or ideas. I'll show you how to create and code to nodes manually in just a moment, but you can also do it automatically through a text search query. I want to grab a little bit more context. So when I look at the reference view, you can see that just water quality is in black and the text around it is gray. So if I were to create a node right now from these results, that would just be a count of water quality. The node would just contain the water quality, phrase water quality over and over again. But the power of qualitative data is the context. I want to know what people are saying about water quality. So I'm going to rerun the query with a few words on each side. And now I'm ready to create a node. I do that through saving results. So I'll call this node water quality. Because I'm creating this node from a query, it's going to put it in results folder, which I'll show you where that is. And people will open the results for me, but to get to those results, I need to navigate to queries. And to merge it into my main nodes folder here, I just need to copy and paste. So let's open this node. So here is a node that contains water quality, all mentions of it, with a little bit of context. It's a little messy though. I have parts of sentences and parts of questions as well as responses. So I want to take a look at the original interview and clean up the codex. So I'm going to just return to Barbara's interview here. And when I return to her interview, you can see that there's some highlighting here. And that's because I've accessed her interview from the node. So it's highlighting all of the places where there's coding. I can also turn on another visual tool called Coding Stripes, which is showing me coding for each of the cases. So you can see here's the Barber case, here's the Henry case. And also this pink stripe is referring to where there's coding for water quality. So if I were to scoot down a little bit, here's another discussion of water quality. So if I scroll up and start reading again, let's say I decide that this whole two-paragraph discussion that Barbara says is actually all about water quality. So I've selected this text, and I can add that additional text to my water quality node. So I've gone ahead and done that. A couple of, of things have happened. That pink water quality stripe has extended to the length of those two paragraphs, which tells me the text opposite this stripe is coded to water quality. 
the highlighting has also extended to cover those two paragraphs, which right now is indicating coding for water quality as well. When I open the node, you'll be able to see that InVivo has added additional context without double coding things. So it hasn't, I selected data that was already coded and it just added the context. I can code to other nodes or concepts in my data as well. So when I do that, I like to turn highlighting off. The coding stripes will still tell me what I'm coding for. So again, these data were gathered after a period of economic expansion, and I'm interested in the relationship potentially between real estate development, so buildings and plots that were developed during this time of economic expansion, and a potential relationship with water quality. So here I can see that Barbara starts discussing Oops, let me grab actually the text here. Barbara starts discussing development. So I've selected that text and I want to create a new node called development. So I've got a new node over here called development that contains that first mention of development. And you can see over here to the right, I've got a new coding stripe for development. I can always remove text from a node as well. So if, for instance, I decide that actually this bit of Barbara's interview shouldn't be in the water quality node, I can choose to uncode that text as well. As you start to think about topics that are present in your data, you start to read through, for some people, it's helpful to visualize your your ideas your, or potential nodes or topics that you're pl planning on looking for in your data. So if you're a visual person or if you're using a methodology in which you perhaps know some of the topics you're looking for in your data, you can create a mind map to visually explore potential concepts. So you can also share a mind map with a colleague to get feedback on your coding structure. Um, or, you know, save it and compare it to the node structure you end up at the end with. So I'm going to create a sample mind map here. And I can capture topics I want to look for in my data by adding shapes. So here I'm thinking about my early thoughts on coding. And again, I already know that I'm interested, for instance, in real estate development, and which is an economic concept. I know also from my word frequency query that phishing comes up quite a bit. And I could get more specific and differentiate between commercial phishing and recreational phishing. I also know that I'm going to have some ideas related to the natural environment. I already have one, water quality. Maybe I'm also interested in habitat, which also potentially has a relationship with um, real estate development and also changes to the landscape. If I'm not sure where an idea will fit, I can create it as a floating idea. So maybe I'm also interested in changes to the community culture. I can change how the shapes look. So for instance, I could change the fill color, the border color, border width even, font font size, and in this way I can convey additional information about an idea or topic in my node hierarchy. I can change the layout, so if you think more hierarchical, perhaps a vertical one would work, or a different horizontal layout. Once I've finished my map, I can potentially export it as a static image, but within NPivo I can create these as empty nodes ready for coding. 
So I'm just going to create them in my main nodes folder. When I navigate up to nodes, here are those nodes that have been created as a result of my mind map. So I've got nested empty nodes in my hierarchy here. So I've got my fishing ideas and my natural environment ideas. I can easily add, delete, or rearrange nodes. So if I wanted to get rid of a node entitled uh, change, uh, I'm sorry, entitled early thoughts on coding, I can simply move these two nodes out from underneath it by dragging them onto the main nodes folder and delete that early thoughts on coding node. So I have two water quality nodes, which I only need one here. Um, I can just merge them together, so I can choose to cut this node and merge the two nodes together. Same story with real estate development. And Vivo has a feature as well called aggregate, which will allow me to ask questions of umbrella ideas without having to code to both the parent, so that's this node, this top level node is a parent, or the child, which is anything nested underneath. So right now the natural environment node is empty. It's just using to org I'm just using it to organize some additional concepts. But if I were to turn on aggregation, it would code everything from any one of the child nodes. So right now, only water quality is coding, but if there's anything coded to landscape or habitat as well, up to the parent node. So down the line, if I wanted to explore all of the places where there was coding at any natural environment idea, and real estate development to explore the relationship between natural environment and real estate development, I can run what's called a coding query to pull up the text that meet those criteria and pull out the overlaps in my coding. I want to take a few moments to talk to you about creating a good node, stru node structure, which is key to making the most of InVivo's querying capabilities. While the nodes that you need depend on your project uh, and your research question, I do have a few best practices that I would like to share with you that will help you create a powerful node hierarchy. First, I'll explain the recommended guidelines and then I'll walk through an example. My number one rule of thumb when nesting nodes underneath other nodes is to ask yourself, is this a type of a parent? So when I built that hierarchy just now, I chose to nest landscape and water quality under natural environment because they are a type of natural environment concept. This is a similar rule, the idea that you should group like ideas together, but I wanted to point out that I did choose to group landscape and water quality, which are similar concepts, so I chose to group them together. So if you follow rule one, rule two, rule two will likely follow as well. So another good example is if I were doing coding for attitude, I would want to group my attitude nodes together. So I would group my positive attitude node together with my negative attitude node. Another best practice is to avoid having the same node in different places across your node hierarchy. The presence of duplicate nodes can mean that you need to rearrange your hierarchy or merge nodes together. When creating codes, we do not recommend creating a node for an intersection of a specific idea. So you'll notice I did not create a node called water quality problems related to real estate development. Rather, we encourage you to create two nodes, one for water quality and one for real estate development, encode the data at both, and use a coding or a matrix coding query to pull out the overlaps. Finally, we recommend you don't create more than three or so levels of nodes. Often this means the nodes that you create are very specific. Try instead to code for overlaps. So I'm going to bring up first an example of an ineffective node structure. We refer to these as viral because of the proliferation of nodes. Note that this example breaks a number of the best practices listed to the left, I think actually all of them. So for instance, this node is trying to capture attitudes about each one of these concepts. So 
it might make intuitive sense at first if you're trying to capture data related to, for instance, how people are discussing habitat or water quality, so whether they're being positive or negative about it, it might make sense at the beginning to nest those nodes underneath. And I'm here to tell you that that is not what we recommend because uh, you can end up with many nodes with the same name. And if you're trying to capture attitude, for instance, across many different ideas, you could end up with as many as 20 or 30 or 50 nodes called positive attitude. This makes it very easy to get lost. You also notice that there are two nodes related to habitat. There's one underneath landscape and a parent node called habitat. And that makes it very difficult to see all data related to, in this instance, habitat in one place. By simplifying the coding categories, I can code more quickly, avoid coding to the wrong node, and still capture the same ideas. So, this powerful node structure example that I'm showing you now captures all of the ideas that were present in the previous node structure. So if I run across a positive comment about water quality, I would code it to both, that, that entire comment code it to both water quality and positive underneath attitude. If, like I did in my example in InVivo, I wanted to code discussion of um, water quality and real estate development and the relationship between the two, if I wanted to capture that, I would code it to both the water quality node and the real estate development node. If they're also discussing an impact of policy, I could code it to a third node. You can code data to as many different nodes as you need. Okay, so I want to take a look at a few more questions before I proceed, and I'm going to provide you some additional information um, on how to get help, uh, on how to learn in vivo, um, and different licensing options. A couple of questions, or a couple of uh, initial comments. One is that if you have a specific question about your project, we're happy to help you with that, but I want to take it offline, so if you, I will provide some contact information uh, at the end of today's webinar. And I have gotten a couple of comments about it going very quickly, and yes, I am very much aware that this goes by fast. We are recording today, and this will be sent to you, uh, and also posted to the YouTube uh, channel, and so you can review this uh, as many times as you would like. A couple of questions around, um, let's see here. So one question is around the different editions, whether you can, everything that I've done today is available in the starter edition. Yes, it is. So you can, uh, with a couple of exceptions. So I guess the answer to that is no. Um, the vast majority of what I've covered today is available in the starter version. Um, you can import text-based data, you can create nodes in code, you can create mind maps, and you can run coding queries, in, and you can create case nodes in the starter edition. You cannot auto-code by structure, so when we created a node for each question or a case node based on the heading, that is not available in starter. And question, a, a, a good question that I just want to make sure that I clarify is how to code to two nodes. So the way that you would do that is when you select an area of text, you would go through the process of assigning it to a node, and you would do that twice. So you would, you would select the data, either drag and drop or right click, and code it to two separate nodes at the same time. And one last question about in vivo and transcription. In vivo does not transcribe audio within the software itself. However, we have partnered with TranscribeMe. So if you 
uh, wanted to upload your audio files to InVivo and send them off to TranscribeMe. And you can connect with your TranscribeMe account and be transcribed. Uh, the transcriptions would be downloaded into your InVivo project. If you don't need the audio in your project, I do recommend transcribing beforehand. So if all you need is just the text of what people are saying and you're not interested in analyzing pauses or intonations or anything like that, then I do recommend just importing the transcript like we did today. And one last question is whether projects can be merged. Yes. In the beginning, I showed a chart that compared the three editions and I mentioned teamwork. And that is specifically referring to um, the ability to merge together projects. So that is how you can collaborate in InVivo standalone. And I'll go over additional collaboration options in just a moment. Two more things, actually. So, um, and actually this leads nicely, one of them leads nicely into um, some licensing options. Transcribe Me is the name of the uh, software with which we've Partnered, so T R A N S C R I B E M E. So we do have a number of licensing options, including discounted student licenses. And so these are um, full functionality, but time limited to 12 months. You can also choose to purchase a perpetual license. Uh, so these are one-time purchase licenses. These full licenses are, one, are perpetual one-time purchase licenses for individuals. You can also choose to purchase an optional subscription, which entitles you to priority support and any new versions that are released during the term of your subscription. If you're interested in working as a team in InVivo, our InVivo for Teams server add-on allows groups to work simultaneously in the same project without the need to merge together projects. So you can work collaboratively in InVivo without InVivo for Teams, but this particular add-on ensures streamlined, secure collaboration. If you'd like to try InVivo before you buy, give our free 14-day trial a shot. And I also, I skipped over enterprise license agreements. Um, so if there's a group at your organization that's interested in using InVivo, you might consider an enterprise license agreement. There are a number of benefits to being an ELA holder with us, including free access to new versions and priority support. We want to make sure you're successful in your InVivo project. So to that end, we do offer some paid training and free resources. On the paid training side, we offer on-site classroom workshops that are typically two days long. Check out the event calendar on our website to see if we're coming to a city near you. If you have a group that's interested in learning in vivo, let us know. We're happy to set up a training. Um, this could be in person or um, online, so we're also capable of um, delivering a tailor, tailoring a webinar or web-delivered training to your needs. Our online courses are available at a beginner or more advanced level. These are self-paced and students receive a discount. And if you would like to sit down with us one-on-one -on -one to discuss your project, we're also happy to set up an individual consulting session. On the free resources side, there's a handout attached to go to webinar that has links to many of the free resources I'm about to mention. These include the YouTube channel, which I've mentioned a number of times. It has great how-to videos and recordings of recent webinars. And so this demo, again, will be available on YouTube. Another great resource are user communities. We have a Facebook page, LinkedIn group, user forums, and active Twitter community. These are a great place to interact with other InVivo users and get answers from one of our experts. There are many links to our online help documents on that handout as well. These are The online help documents are a great place to get detailed information on how to do anything in InVivo. And thank you for joining this webinar today. Uh, keep an eye out for more in the future. Our Meet InVivo series is a great way to get acquainted with useful features in InVivo. Just a couple of additional questions I want to uh, take a peek at. Uh, 
um, a question about licensing. Full licenses do entitle you to two activations for personal use, so you could put it on your desktop and your laptop, for instance. So if there's a question that we didn't get to today, please send it to Americas at qsinternational.com. Or if you would like more information, please email us as well. If you're on Twitter, we'd love to connect with you. Our main Twitter handle is at qsrint. Our support team is available through our website, qsrinternational.com, as well as through their Twitter handle at qsrsup. And I'm at Edwin Wyman Roth. I like to share uh, NPVO tips and tricks and answer questions from our NPVO Twitter community. Thanks for joining me this afternoon, and best of luck with your NVivo projects.